Hello and welcome to the Kielder Observatory podcast, a very special episode because we've had some major news in the world of astronomy through the course of this week. You may have seen the images on social media, you may even have shared them yourself, but the first real images from deep into space from the new James Webb telescope have been uh, revealed, not just through the earlier part of this week, they were sort of teased a little bit, but we've seen the, the first images and a huge explanation of what it is that we're exactly seeing and what we aim to do through the course of the next 45 minutes hour or so here on our special Kilda Observatory podcast is to bring you a bit more information and a bit more insight from some of our astronomers about what it is that we are seeing in these very first images from the James Webb Space Telescope. And of course, we've talked um, on previous episodes of our podcast about this telescope, about how important it's going to be. And finally, we're here at this day where we're seeing for real these images for the first time. And it's very important for the Northeast because quite a lot of work on these, the equipment that has been able to bring us these images um, has been undertaken here in the Northeast, working closely with Durham University. And uh, one of the people involved in that project joins us to tell us more about the equipment and exactly how it all works and what we might be able to see in future as well. So let me introduce our team that are joining us today. First of all, from Kielder Observatory, we've got uh, Adam Shaw, education lead. He's got a, a degree in astrophysics. He knows what he's on about. Hi, Adam. Hello. I feel like you've hyped me up a bit too much there. No hey, well, look, if, if we don't do the hyping, who will? Uh, this is the uh, always a question. I've also got uh, Finn, astronomer, masters in astrophysics and cosmology, and also he was lucky enough to also use the Hubble data to study galaxy clusters in his dissertation. So Hubble's a bit of a uh, an expert area, and, and now of course James Webb taking things to the next level. So we'll be able to get a good comparison here. Hi, Finn. Hi there, Ian. Nice to nice to be here. And, uh, well, it's good to have you with us. And, and Adam and Finn, if you've been up to Kielder Observatory at any point over the last year or two, then you probably have seen them at some point, maybe as well. Now, also joining us, we have uh, Jürgen Schmoll. Hello, Jürgen. Hi, hey, good evening. Now, Jürgen, um, originally an astronomer and, and then became now senior optical engineer at the Centre for Advanced Instrumentation at Durham University, who have played a huge role in creating some of the technology that's on board the James Webb Space Telescope and has been involved in bringing us these images today. So I imagine, Jürgen, these images, a great source of pride for you from the work that you did a little while ago now, the equipment that's on there, and finally to see that it's firstly working a million miles away in space, and then to see the results that I imagine uh, uh, I mean, the mind blowing to, to everyone who's seen them, but of course, for you, it must be amazing to see all this hard work now starting to deliver results. Yes, yeah, it's, it's definitely breathtaking. Uh, you've got a bit of a personal attachment to the whole project, and um, so it, it was my biggest Christmas present, really, during Christmas when the rocket got launched, and I could see that it all worked according to plan. So it's really exciting times. And what's the general mood among those that have been involved in the project? Because, as you say, it took a little while for the whole thing to be launched with various delays here on Earth. And, and now it's, it's up there, the various stages of, of getting the James Webb uh, telescope to its position, it all unfurling. We saw that on the news. And everything seems to be working up to this point pretty perfectly. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a miracle. It's the work which all uh, went into this because there's only one attempt if anything would have gone wrong, a solar sail wouldn't have deployed or the mirror would have jumped, the whole project would have been a failure. We could, can, cannot send anybody out to do any repairs. It's too far away. And so there was only this one shot and everything had to work at once, which is partly to blame for this long, long delays because all the different groups are working on the different aspects of the telescope obviously had to make sure that everything works to exactly 100%, not 99.9%, 100% to make sure there's no unnecessary risk. And just to emphasize the the um, role that, that Durham University, the Center for Advanced Instrumentation, your group that were involved in this, and, and, and the contribution really for the whole Northeast, because this is a worldwide project, the whole world was watching these images come out, but the Northeast here, Northeast of England has played a, a huge role in making it possible and providing the, the science behind this to, to, to make these images a reality. 
Yes, yeah, so the UK played a big, big role in particular for the instrument side of the telescope. So while the telescope has been built in in the USA, um, many of the instruments were built in Europe and especially in, in the UK. There's the MIRI instrument, which was built mostly by the UK ATC in Edinburgh. And we got involved uh, into the NERSPEC spectrograph side. NERSPEC is an immature interspectrograph. And within NERSPEC, I was responsible for developing some calibration and ground support hardware, which um, was used to calibrate the whole NERSPEC instrument to align it. And um, on top of this uh, particular exciting for I wasn't personally involved in this bit was we made a little bit of in-flight hardware and so-called integral field unit, which was made in Setchfield just outside of Durham, where we have another plant called Net Park in, in, in the Net Park development. Uh, using a diamond five axis machine, a uh, multi segmented mirror array has been made with the task to dissect the image of, let's say, a galaxy into lots of little spatial elements. And each spatial element makes its own way through a spectrograph. So you get a spectrum of each spatial element and you can <clears throat> spatially resolve uh, uh, your spectra. So you can, instead of getting a brightness value for each uh, pixel, to say it this way, you get a whole spectrum for each pixel. Okay, well, we're going to um, have a look at some of the images in just a moment. But first of all, from an astronomer's point of view, Adam, Finn, when, when you saw these images, what, what have you seen? How excited are you guys? Well, I mean, we, we love science, of course, up there at the, at the observatory. We love to do our own science. But, of course, we're not researchers. Um, and really, we just like looking at pretty pictures and showing the guests how fantastic they are and talking about how brilliant they are. So when when you got to see these pictures uh, sort of last week, last night and then this afternoon, I mean, they're incredible. The detail in them, they're absolutely astonishing. And it's fantastic to get to see these images and know that, I mean, we're going to have to go and update all of our talks, get all these new images in, <laughs> nice shiny big galaxies. Um, but they give a great chance to actually explain to the guests because now we can see so much detail inside a nebula or so much detail inside a galaxy when they ask, oh, how, how's a star born inside a cloud? And now you can see it happening. You can literally point to the place where a star is being born. Oh, it's going to be great for us. It's going to be fantastic. What about you, Adam? It's just incredible i mean it's been so long kind of just talking about james Webb space telescope telling people telling the school kids that this thing is going to be launched soon and it finally got launched on on christmas day which was i mean as you can say best christmas present ever and now and there it is yeah. seeing the photos, oh yeah. it's such a beautiful thing <laughs> yeah. uh, but now that we've actually got photos of it that we can <coughs> see the results of it and just knowing that this is just the start as well it's oh, i'm so excited Right, well, let's have a look at the images then. This is what you've been uh, waiting for all this time. There are five images that have been released and also some extra information about what the telescope has been able to gather in, in terms of data from even you know billions and billions of miles away. And, and it's, it's, it's quite interesting in, in the course of the, the possibilities of life as well. So we'll start off with this one. Uh, this is called SMAX0723. There it is, uh, a galaxy cluster located over 4 billion light years from Earth, um, dominated by a large central elliptical galaxy, but its overall mass acts like a giant lens and it allows us to look behind the cluster at even more distant galaxies. And this, that, that's this, firstly the mind-boggling thing. We had this general image that was put out as a teaser the other day, didn't we, that, that looks a little bit similar to this. Uh, you know, these are entire galaxies that are so far away that we just can't, you can't even imagine, how, you know, billions of years away, even with light. It's fantastic. Just, even just putting the image in perspective is, is mind blowing. Um, like the size, of the, the size of the picture itself, for example, you know, how much of the sky does that, does that picture contain? Is it like a, a hand's full? Is it, is it a moon's full? How much of the sky is that picture? And the galaxies are so far away, it's as much as, I think NASA said, it was a grain of sand held at arm's length. Mm -hmm. It's a grain of sand at arm's length covering the sky, and you get hundreds of individual galaxies, trillions of stars. Even that in itself is such a remarkable achievement, thought. Um, the, the picture, even before you start delving into the details of it, which is fantastic, the picture itself is astonishing that, it's, that we're able to take it, I think. 
for me, yeah. I mean, I mean, you talk about the scale of the thing, but it's like it's distances as well. It's just how far back we are looking. I mean, the main cluster that we're looking at is about four and a half billion light years away. That means mm. the light left that those that cluster of galaxies around about the same time that our solar system was being formed, that the Earth was getting formed. But then some of the more distant galaxies, potentially thirteen plus billion light years away towards <laughs> the start of the universe, not long after the Big Bang. It's just astounding. Yeah, so you, you can see in the image. So I, my my when I said I was lucky enough to use Hubble, um, we downloaded the data that everyone has access to for my project. <laughs> uh, but it was on galaxy clusters. That's what I studied and how they evolve. And it, um, it, it's a really interesting um, area of research because they're they're massive, so they're they're reasonably easy to spot at large distances. But but even with Hubble, as we got beyond two three billion light years, it became very difficult to get any detail in the galaxies. And you can see, or you can see in the middle of that image there, the large kind of like white sort of splodgy galaxy, the big one in the middle. Uh, so that, that's called a bright central galaxy or BCG. It's basically a really, really big, old, dead galaxy because uh, they're not really forming that many new stars in the center of these clusters. They're very, very old. And around this central galaxy, there are many, many other galaxies that have been formed and fall into the cluster over time. So obviously we're looking at it as it was 4 billion years ago, but the universe is nearly 14 billion years old. So it's had, you know, 8, 9 billion years of time to create itself and form. And when you add together all of those galaxies, they are so heavy. There's so much mass inside the cluster that they can bend the light of galaxies behind them, uh, around them. So what you're seeing in this image, all, all the sort of, large bright blobs they are they are members of the clusters including that very large one in the center all the smaller galaxies sort of on the right hand side the top left top right top you know bottom left bottom right they are distant galaxies elsewhere in uh, sort of in the universe but those little smudges those weird little streaks around the big galaxy that you can see those are actually they're not there they don't actually exist there in the picture they're behind that big blob but their light is being bent around us and those galaxies could be as far as 10, 10 billion light years away. And yet, and I'm, you know, anyone that has these images, you go on and zoom in on them. You can get detail in them. You can get what we've seen, uh, the central bulge or the disk. So most spiral galaxies have a big, big blob right in the middle. That's the oldest bit of the galaxy. I kind of like think galaxies are a bit like cities, really. They have a big old center full of old stars. It's very bright. That's the big bulge. And then they're surrounded by like the suburbs, which is this disk of stars and we've never ever ever been able to see these in distant galaxies we've assumed that they're there right but they're, they're so difficult to spot and yet in this image they're there which is which is in itself is important because now we know that galaxies were able to to form central bulges and disks even only a few billion years two three billion <laughs> years after the big Bang itself which is really 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 useful yeah, and, and Jürgen, that was the first image that was fully shown in the presentation today. What were your thoughts on seeing seeing that? Yeah, I was fascinated mostly by all this gravitational lensing and all this Einstein arcs you can see in this picture, because it's not really completely explained uh, where these arcs are coming from. I mean, the mechanism was already understood by Einstein with the general relativity. He said you should see things like this and it was proven with the solar eclipse and the star. But the mass of the galaxies we see alone cannot explain this degree of distortion we see. And there's this so-called dark matter behind us, which is material which optically is not visible, but the gravity is there. And it seems not to interact with normal matter. And that's... Uh, you can see the effect of something that is itself still not understood and completely unknown. And hopefully more detailed analysis of this distortion the, together with the topology of the matter we can see will give more clues about what this dark matter really is. And so, so questions posed there from the very first image in our understanding of this part of the yeah. universe. Definitely, yeah. Okay, so that was the first one. There's, there's five in total, so we'll move to the next one, which is the Southern Ring Nebula. 
By the way, you can actually comment as well in the comments section. Uh, we can uh, we can see your questions. We'll run through them if we've got time at the end. But uh, just to say, uh, James Garbett says, good to see this stream is going a bit more smoothly than NASA's James Webb Telescope stream earlier today. Saying nothing, James. Saying nothing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think we watched the re the rehearsal, to be honest. But uh, there we go. Southern Ring uh, Nebula, then planetary nebula in Vela. It's um, it's an expanding ring of gas emitted in the final death throes of a dying star, two thousand light years away from Earth. Have a look at this. Uh, there we go. Um, so tell us about this image, then, Adam. Oh, so I mean, so this is the remains of a star, a star that uh, once upon a time would have been similar to our own sun. Uh, but kind of when our sun eventually dies, it's going to puff out to an enormous size. It's going to become what's called a red giant star. And eventually what will end up happening is it will um, engulf the inner solar system. So the orbits of Mercury, Venus, and possibly Earth will all be inside the sun. Then once it's that big, it's going to puff out and shed its outer layers. And those outer layers expanding out into space will form an object like this, an object known as a planetary nebula. And this is the remains of a dead star, a star that was sort of once like our own sun. Um, and the detail we can see here is incredible. So we're kind of seeing a comparison here between two different um, cameras, two different instruments uh, on the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and we're basically looking at different wavelengths of infrared light here. So we've got the near infrared light and the mid infrared light uh, which i'm sure jürgen Jür i'm sure jürgen can explain much better than i ever could uh, <laughs> however the thing that kind of really strikes me is that when you look at this central part of the image on the right hand side you can see there's actually two stars in the middle there whereas when you look at it just on the left hand side um it only looks like the one star so kind of this i think this is a really good um, example of why using these different uh, wavelengths of light, these different types of light that we're able to look at in, it can reveal things that otherwise might not be spotted, that you might not actually be able to see. Yeah, I, I love that as well, because it's it's the shape of the nebula itself is, is influenced by there being two stars in the middle. So like a binary system, of course, that's when there are two stars uh, in the same solar system. So they actually orbit each other, right? They're, they're, they're related in a way, I guess. So. Um, and you can see one of them has died. So the one on the right, on the right image there in the very center, you've got a red one and a blue one. The one on the right died. And as Adam was saying, they, they they're basically like snakes, right? They shed their skin at the very end of their lives. Um, and their skin sort of is blown away by the hot stars that are still there. So their solar wind blows it into a big kind of a sphere, right? It actually kind of look like two bowls on top of each other. But we're not looking at it from the right direction to see that. We're looking at it at face. <laughs> But what I find really amazing, and you can see it really well on the right-hand image, which is the uh, the mid-infrared, the MIRI cam, but you can also see it on the near-infrared camera, is these kind of waves. There's one above and there's one below. Because the star doesn't just, you know, shed all of its skin at once and then it's done. It does it in kind of waves, right? It, it sheds it over time. And because these stars are spinning around each other, and the one on the left, which hasn't died yet, is still pretty large, got very strong solar wind, as they spin, it blows the gas in kind of like waves, like spiral waves, which you can see. I think NASA described it as stirring the pot, basically, because they stir the gas and blow it away. I just, I just, I think it's remarkable. You can see these waves of gas as they leave the star and travel off into space. Uh, and to think that our sun, because these are reasonably sun-like stars. I don't know exactly how, how similar they are, but they're reasonably sun-like. Um, and this is kind of what our solar system would look like in five billion years when our star dies it's kind of looking into the future in a way as well which is amazing to see I mean, what's the scale of, of of distance there that we're seeing well, you know what's the do we know how how big that you know that whole area is uh so i All the shock the waves across i couldn't tell you off the top of my head what the scale of this image is but planetary nebulas are usually re reasonably small they're maybe only a few light years across so, so I was, I, mean, I was actually checking this earlier. So it's it's it's, it's even smaller than that. I think this one oh, was really? about um, between half a light year and one light year across, oh, like from end to end. Uh, so wow. if they want, if anyone wants that in miles, that's sort of between <laughs> three and six trillion miles wide. So yeah. it's pretty still big. pretty far. It's still quite oh, a yeah, absolutely. Way, it's a fairly yeah. wide angle lens. Yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jürgen, we've had one or two questions about this. The, these images that we're seeing, of course, these are 
taken infrared, aren't they? They're not. They're not an optical uh, photo as such. But how do we? How are, how are the colours formed? Is this what the, the actual colours would be like in space? Are they artificially coloured? And people are asking about that. Yeah, it's definitely artificial colouring. If you could fly out to the James Webb Space Telescope, there would be an eyepiece on it, and you would observe in this wavelength range, you would see probably a very dark red of the hydrogen alpha line, which is a very prominent uh, gas emission line in space, which you can see in the left picture. But uh, actually, all the other waves are in wavelength ranges where our eye would see just black, because our eye is not made up for this. So it's all artificial colouring. And what astronomers usually do is they color the shorter wavelengths bluish, the medium wavelengths reddish, greenish or yellowish, and then the long wavelengths they color in red. So they transform the spectrum roughly into a spectrum as we would experience it if the wavelength range would be ours. So I take it the hydrogen alpha on the left side will be this very bluish white, uh, very bright, very thin shell you can see looking a bit like it's like a tilted zero around the star. And what we see in red there is a wavelength which is much further to the uh, longer wave spectrum and would be invisible for the human eye. That's uh, Jürgen Schmoll, who was involved in this uh, project on the James Webb Telescope and the instrumentation aboard it that's bringing us these images for the first time. And I know some people are seeing these for the first time um, this evening, such as Jess. I haven't had a chance to look at these yet. Loving the first viewing with your expertise. Well, I'll tell you what, my favourite of the of the images is coming next. It's the Carina Nebula, a star-producing region, 8,000 light years from Earth. And um, I'm just going to find that image for you now. Here we go. This is stunning. So look at that. Um, so tell us about this then. This, this is um, home to the Milky Way's brightest known star, um, home to some of the most fantastic objects in, in the galaxy. So I don't know who else takes the lead in this, whether Finn or, or Adam or Jürgen, but uh, you go for it. Well, maybe, maybe the big difference between this diffuse nebula and the planetary nebula we saw before, apart from its size, is this little nose, uh, which you can see the top left going out into space, this little protrusion, it's about seven light years I read today. So it's very, the whole structure is very bigger than a planetary nebula. The other difference is, while the planetary nebula is a dying star, here we see a stellar nursery where new stars are formed. So all this denser cold clouds, they hide away regions where just gravity slowly but surely attracts more material. And as more material you get, as more gravity you get, you get even more material. It's a bit like in Monopoly, where the richer person, people usually gain more and more and more money. In the game, the gravity works a bit the same. Uh, if you have more gravity, you can get more material in. That means you get more gravity. And at one point, you get enough gravity to form a star. And this is what we see here. It's a, like a big star formation region. So, yeah. And, and you were saying about this earlier, um, Finn and Adam, about people are ask. I mean, you, you do entire sessions, I know, at Kielder Observatory about the life of stars. And, and our previous podcast episode um, last month, in fact, if you want to go back and, and listen to that, was all about stars as well. And we were talking about the birth of stars and we were explaining how it's very difficult to sort of explain it. But maybe an image like this helps give people a, a sense of, of reality about how things work. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 not it's not a very easy concept sometimes to get your head around how you can get a big cloud like that, which which kind of well, it looks like a big mess really, and you can get stars from it. And as Jürgen was explaining, it's all to do with the collapse of gravity, um, and gravity is really weak, very 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 weak as a force. So it takes a long time for these stars to actually fall. It's an individual, a tiny mass in that nebula, most of it obviously being hydrogen with a bit of helium in there as well. It takes a long time for it to kind of attract other um, other other elements, right? Other other molecules. Um, and we think, and images like this really help because one of the things that we, we don't really understand about star formation is how many stars will you get forming in one single region? Right? Why do we get really, really big stars and really, really small stars? Um, and one of the ideas is that you can you know, like sort of perturbations, right? Areas that get disturbed. And this shows it really well. You can see sort of towards the top, there's lots of bright stars. 
Um, so they've already been born and they kind of they act like little fans. They blow off lots of material out into space and any dust that is near them once they've been born gets blown away. So ultraviolet light is very good at this. It kind of blows out the gas and it's kind of blown it downwards into this ridge. So along the ridge, the gas is getting squashed all together, which kind of helps it out, gives gravity a kind of like a, a little kick and it helps gravity along and squashes this cloud into these denser pockets, which then will further collapse, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, and they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it's hot enough inside that tiny, tiny pocket of, of glass to start nuclear fusion, which is just a, a, a special reaction inside stars that fights the collapse, right? That's when the star starts to shine. It's when it gives off its light, it gives off its heat, and you get a star being born. And in this picture, what's fantastic is on some of them, if you zoom in on some of the stars, there's one just off to the right in the middle there. That's a star that has very, very recently been born, maybe the last, the few, last few million years, maybe. And you can see these dust rings around them and sort of jets that are getting blown off the star as it's being born, as the fan, if you like, is being turned on and it starts to blow away gas in its area. Um, and it's really helpful to be able to point to these things now and say, it looks like that. That's what it looks like. That is a region there full of new stars. And with new stars come new planets, which is one of our next, one of James Webb's next targets. And with new planets, who knows, comes new life. So looking at nebulous regions are, are fantastic. You know, with Hubble, even with our telescopes at the observatory, you can see some of the closest ones. To think in a way these are the future of the universe and it's going to be a they're the, the last stars in a way to be born because we now understand that, that most of the stars in the universe that have ever lived that will ever live have already been born so we're getting a very rare glimpse of last i think it's about five or maybe five ten percent of the stars that will ever live um it's the last five percent that are being born now and it's great to be able to see them in this this detail from james webb it's it's really amazing a few questions that we'll just go through, and then we'll talk more to Jürgen about the, the the whole project that he's been involved in behind this. Um, one from Stu, who says, what are the chances of there being life in that photo, do you think? Are we talking about that photo, are we? Well, there any of well, them, I suppose. Any, any of the, that one. the big one, the big <laughs> one, the first one we showed, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's controversial to say, but I'd say 100%. 99 .99, let's build in some, some wiggle room in case I'm wrong. <laughs> Well, I'm at I'd agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the sheer amount of, um, I mean, galaxies that we're seeing there, and therefore the sheer amount of stars uh, within that image, essentially, and then the sheer amount of planets around said stars, it, in my opinion, it would be ridiculous to think that we might be the only ones, kind of the only place with life. And uh, personally, I think there must be life all over the place and even though this is just a tiny patch of sky so it's been explained before it's like if you hold a grain of sand at, at, uh, at arm's length blocking out the sky that tiny patch of sky has thousands of galaxies in it and trillions and trillions of stars within those galaxies so so Probably, yeah there must be life there sure. i suppose the thing is your little green men if there are some they're, they're, they're 12 billion years away so it's it's quite it's quite a journey, isn't it? But you look yeah. at the size of that and the, the amount of well, who, galaxies who there are. Many, it's... Who knows? There might be there might be an aliens web in there looking back at us and seeing our well, Milky Way as it was twelve billion years ago. That's, our that's very first, cool. yeah, our very first episode was with Wallace Arthur, who is a guy that knows all about these things, and he was absolutely one hundred percent put his house on it, convinced <laughs> that more advanced life has been looking at us for quite a while so there's something to uh, we'll talk about and have a listen to that very first episode from a little while ago now Jürgen let's talk about um, some of the you, you brought us some slides and uh, we can we'll go back to the beginning there so then we're at the wrong end of that um, you've been involved in this project for quite some time when did you first get involved with the James Webb Space Telescope and, and the instrumentation on board it yeah, it was actually quite a funny little involvement it started in the year 2006 when uh, my uh, my boss came in and asked me to de design some little lenses because I just learned how to do optical design using a ray tracing software. So I designed a little piece of optics and didn't even then really know for what it was. And then he wanted changes in it and there was more optics design. 
to be done. And then suddenly I got introduced into the whole picture and what it was, I was designing optics which was used to measure other optics. And this other optics to be measured was the optics of the whole Nurseback instrument. So the Nurseback instrument was built in Germany in, in a location near Munich of what's now called Airbus Defense in Space. Back then it was Astrium. And we got as a subcontractor, we got uh, to design the optics which is used to analyze the wave front coming from the instrument and which means when you adjust the optics just right to get a nice sharp image across the whole uh, image if you very well so you have to make sure that you can simulate the space telescope by some small optics okay so it's tell us about your you you've got some slides for us here about um how how things work and and, and what we might be seeing yeah. explain this one to us because um this obviously has got some some science involved here but you're explaining about radio waves and 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 this is what it is isn't it this as i say these images that we're seeing is not are not um optical images through a normal camera these are radio images in, in, in essence and of course keel has got a radio telescope but this is infrared um and and that's the way that you can see so far into the the universe and and it doesn't actually take that long does it these images were were shot over a, a relatively short period of time the exposure on this has not been weeks or months since it was launched this is this is fairly quick work yes yeah this shows how much bigger this uh, collecting surface is compared with hubble hubble is nowadays classified as a small telescope with only two meter 40 diameter so this new telescope is about three times larger in diameter, which means about eight, nine times more collecting power. So in, you get in one minute what you get in nine minutes is Hubble, to say it this way. Of course, it's a little bit, Hubble has its slightly different wavelengths, but Hubble is more or less on the optical waves. And what this graph shows here, it shows actually the, the opacity of the atmosphere. Opacity means the blocking of the atmosphere. When you look at the top graph, you see every where you see 100%, it means the atmosphere blocks all the light coming to Earth. And at the bottom, you see the wavelength of light from 0.1 nanometer down to one kilometer. So it's a very big spectrum. We're actually quite grateful that some of the waves don't make it to Earth, like very harsh UV radiation, which would be not very good for life. But you can see there's only one uh, optical window, which is all what we can see at the telescope like this little spectrum, what you see there, this colorful bit. And the other much bigger window you see further to the right, which is a radio window. So for radio astronomy, where you can see straight out into space. But you see, there's a very, very complicated shape of transmission that you have some narrow bands where you can, from high altitude observatories, just see some infrared, but other infrared, infrared wavelengths next to it are blocked out. And this is what uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is doing. When you look at one micron, just one U meter, uh, you see this Greek letter there, from one micron over 10 micron, 100 micron, that's about the wave the James Webb. The James Webb Telescope goes from 0.6 micron to 27 micron. So this is about the wavelength range. And you see lots of this light is blocked off by the atmosphere. So you have to go into space. And of course, you get the side effects. The atmosphere is not turbulent. You don't have clouds. You can look out there 24-7, uh, really. Yeah, that's it's certainly by... I mean, the weather is obviously a big issue, isn't it? And, and and of course, the the various radiation we face from the sun, but getting the telescope out there in space and a million miles away from the Earth and pointing it in a in a, a direction into, into deep space uh, bypasses all of that. Let's have a look at the next... Um, slide which explains the mirror and this of course is the the bit that people will have seen a lot of on on the james webb telescope it it looks a bit like a honeycomb um people of a certain era will like nick to the the blockbusters board uh but uh, nonetheless there it is and and tell us what this does because this was a real complex part of the mission wasn't it that it it had to unfurl and unfold and expand in space and, and if this hadn't have happened the whole thing would have been junked wouldn't it but um tell us about the mirror yeah, so what you see here is on the top right, you see a comparison between the Hubble telescope and the world. You can see the person next to it. This mirror in diameter is just a little bit bigger than an average person. Uh, two meter 
40. And you can also see this mirror is silver. It was aluminized. Like many telescopes, like the telescopes at Kiel are aluminized. Now, the James Webb telescope is actually gold coated. And the reason for this is um, to reflect the infrared light better. And um, then you can see this mirror is much big. And this has the consequence it doesn't fit into a rocket at one piece. So it had to be made in segments, which then on a type of scaffold can be folded back together and then uh, unfold a bit like a flower once in space and adjust to each other. And this was much different from the Hubble mirror, which was just one single monolithic mirror. The Hubble fitted into the loading bay of the space shuttle. This was the way it was launched. It could have been on the nose cone of a, a rocket, no problem. But a six meter 50 telescope wouldn't, even today, wouldn't go on, onto any rockets. The rockets are not big enough for this, so it had to be folded. And the way to do it is you panel the plane by hexagonal patterns. These hexagons save the advantage. You can tile them very near together, so you get a very good fill factor. Uh, they are all the Earth, Earth, Earth bound telescope built like this, like the EELT, which is built at the moment, which is an Earth bound telescope is even 40 meter diameters you couldn't make a mirror of that size for various reasons so it's made out of lots of little mirrors adding together so that's the, mirror, see, the hugely important part of the mission isn't it yeah oh yes yeah what you see it's a bottom right by the way it looks like hmm, it's a bit small i thought it's been bigger this is just a model this was a test model i think it was five times smaller than the real thing which was a test model which was supposed to work like the real one this was done already 15 years ago or so to gain experience on how to make those mirrors so i suppose it's it's roughly the probably about the size of a an average two-story house isn't it if you know when you look at how many meters yeah. that must be it's 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 fairly big am i am yes. i right in thinking yeah, as well that sorry there yeah i was just i'm right in thinking that it didn't quite go unhitched because it was hit by a meteorite, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, this was making the news. And what it is, uh, the telescope is the Lagrange point. They've sent it to the Lagrange point because it's a stable point where the telescope can stay for a long time orbiting this Lagrange point, where in principle, uh, the gravity of the Earth and the Sun add so that this spacecraft falls further away from the Earth, uh, further away from the Sun than the Earth. It still has the same angular velocity but because it's a stable point it also gets some dodgy friends they are like all sorts of cosmic dust and wobble which can also uh, gets into this Lagrange points and so occasionally you get uh, an unaccount for tiny little it's which happens every now this it will measure the key of each segment by pointing the telescope to a star and says so they can optimize the shape of each actuator. Now this mirror which got hit got damaged a bit more than expected, so they can't get the shape absolutely right anymore. But still this mistake, this, this aberration they got by this, it's so small that it's negligible and it's hardly uh, having any influence on the performance of the telescope because the main surface is so large that a small blemish of a few centimeters is not making much of a harm. Phew. Well, that's a relief. Um, let's let's move on to your next um, slide then. Tell us tell us what this one's all about then, uh, Jürgen, what we're seeing here. Yeah, that's the orbit of the uh, telescope. This whole uh, uh, drawing is not scale, by the way. You see the sun in the middle, and to the right you see the Earth and the moon. And it's in principle sun, Earth, and moon are on the left side of the telescope. And on the right side, there's just the space. And the whole telescope is built with this shield. So in principle, we have a daytime side, which is illuminated all constantly. So all, so all the mission over all the years, it will be permanent sunlight, which means the solar panels can operate the telescope. The aerial antennas are there uh, sending the data back to Earth and receiving the comments of Earth what to do next. And then on the other side of the shield, in permanent shadow, there is telescope which is cooled down to cryogenic temperatures which means temperatures which are extremely cold only a few 10 kelvin when you think zero kelvin is minus 273 degrees so it's something like minus 240 degrees centigrade 
So it's very, very cold, which is necessary for infrared radiation because the thermal radiation actually acts as a background light. So to keep this cold in the shadow means you don't get any stray light, any thermal stray light, uh, which would affect your data quality. Okay, so that gives you, a, you a, an idea of where it is in the, in, in the space. Yeah. yeah, it's um, uh, you can see how uh, the moon is only about a quarter of the distance what the James Webb is doing. So the idea of an astronaut could repair this telescope like what was possible in, in the Hubble case, which was on low Earth orbit, um, uh, even if we had still space shuttles or something. I mean, the furthest distance we ever traveled was the Apollo missions to the moon, and you would have, have to go four times further to repair this telescope. So this is at the moment impossible with the spacecrafts we have. So it makes it so ambitious because you had only this one shot and everything to go right. It's a good new movie plot, though, for Hollywood, isn't it, to have somebody go up and repair <laughs> the telescope? A million oh, yeah. miles away. And Tom Hanks will be starring in that, I'm sure, soon. Um, this, this is a, a good look at the, uh, at, at the telescope itself, isn't it? And, and what we've, we've uh, got on here and, and, and some of the key components on board. Yeah, when you think about a telescope, you think about a closed tube. Even the Hubble Space Telescope is a silver bus sized uh, round structure. Uh, this telescope rather looks like a radio telescope. You have a dish and then three outwiggles which holds the subreflector, as they call it in radio astronomy, the secondary mirror, and the light from there travels back. So the light comes from the right, it hits the mirror in the middle, and then gets focused onto this what's called OTE secondary mirror there. And this secondary mirror changes the ratio of the beams converge and sends the beam into this tiny hole on this little tower in the middle of the primary mirror. The light goes through there and hits the instruments which are on the back side. And everything what we see here on top of this, what looks a bit like a canopy, this um, uh, uh, sun shield, everything on top, technically, you wouldn't be able to see it because it's all in the shadow. And on the other side, you see the star trackers, which keep the attitude of the instrument right, that we know where the instrument is, and the spacecraft booth, which is the part which communicates to Earth. Okay. And and what we're seeing here, are these some of the components? And you were involved in in the actual mission in a way, weren't you, of course, with uh, your work at the Centre for Advanced Instrument, Instrumentation in, in Durham. But tell us what we're seeing here. Yeah, here, this is the part where, actually, sadly, personally, I wasn't directly involved in this one because it's real in-flight hardware, but it was my group doing this. And we used a special machine, which you can imagine like a lace, like a metal working lace, but this lace working on air bearings and using a diamond as a tool. And this is possible to make an uh, optical surface in metal. The whole structure, the whole instrument, this nurse back IFU integral field unit, uh, is about the size of the shoebox. You see it's at the bottom right. I think it's an eight inch long ruler, 200 millimeter at the bottom there. This is all made out of aluminum. That means if it expands or contracts as temperature changes, everything stays aligned. And there are uh, mirrors. When you look at the top left, the first mirror, which looks rectangular with this little step in the middle, this is actually lots of very thin stripes, a few ten of them, uh, which are all machined and they're all earth mirrors. And the image of, let's say, a galaxy will be formed on top of this mirror and depending on where on the mirror it falls, the image gets sent to a different second mirror, which is called the so pupil mirror. The, the pupil mirror you see um, on the middle of the three pictures of, uh, in the, on the left side, that's the pupil mirror. And this pupil mirror, this actually uh, uh, has a bit of a blurred image, and this image is then refocused onto the slip mirror, which is the third one, the one on the bottom on the left side. And this, this mirror, they still look silver there. That means they were just machined. But as you can see on the top right in the real flight model, after it was integrated there, you can see the mirror is now golden because it got gold coated because gold is the best material in terms of reflectivity in the wavelength range James Webb is using. 
Okay, well, I have a look at a couple more photos from James Webb that have been released today in just just one moment. Just finally want to talk about this, the spikes that we've seen in, in some of the pictures. I know you want to talk about this, Jürgen, just to explain a bit of the science bit before we, uh, before we have a look at some more. Yes, yeah, so the spikes, this question is quite often asked, where are the spikes coming from? Is, are they real? Are they really in, in space? And they are not. Actually, the Hubble Space Telescope shows spikes, and many amateur telescopes show spikes. And the left side gives a little bit of an idea what is happening when you have parallel light coming from the left uh, in, the, in the top of this bluish uh, diagram. Um, when it hits an obstacle, it starts to diffract. Some of the light is going away in certain angles because it's due to the wave nature of light. And if you focus what you get from there, you get a line. And the consequences, like for amateur telescopes or even professional telescopes, they are shown in the diagram on the left. The first one, imagine you have your telescope, secondary mirror, just held with one um, vein. Um, then you get one spike. This spike is oriented just perpendicular to the orientation of the vein. If you have three veins, you get six spikes. If you have four veins, you get four spikes again because the spikes fall into each other. Like you see this telescope, this orange one on the top right, it has four spikes, and that will create a pattern like this. The Hubble Space Telescope has it, for example. Now, when we come to James Webb, we get loads of corners where light is diffracted. There are the spikes by the secondary mirror, and there are the spikes by all these hexagonal patterns. Because it's not only one hexagonal mirror, there are loads of them. We get loads of little uh, obstacles which act like a slit in principle and do diffraction. So the six main spikes you see on each star of the James Webb telescope, like this orangey picture what you see um, on the right, um, the six main spikes are caused by all the sum up of the six corners of each mirror segment. So we have lots of corners, so the spikes are relatively bright. And then you get a very dim spike, which is going across just horizontal. And this is caused by the top of the secondary mirror holder, where the bottom two holders, they go parallel with the spikes, which are already there, caused by the hexagon. So the six spikes are caused by the hexagons and the two bottom holders of, this, of the secondary mirror and this other dim spike which goes horizontal only is just caused by the holder on top okay so that's explained the science behind the mirrors let's have a look at uh, another of the images caught today by the james webb space telescope this one is called wasp 96b which sounds quite threatening um tell us what we're seeing here um, Adam, this is uh, well. This is an exoplanet, half the mass of Jupiter. It's one thousand one hundred and fifty light years away from Earth, so a bit of a distance. Um, but what are we seeing? So essentially, we are looking at, um, at at the fact that this planet they found water in its atmosphere. Uh, so when it comes to understanding what stuff in space is made out of. The thing is, you can't really fly to those things and scoop a little bit out and stick under a microscope or something like that because they're a bit far away. So what you have to do is you have to do a spe technique called spectroscopy. Essentially, by capturing the light from, let's say, a star. So if we look at the, if we look at the sun, for example, which normally isn't a good idea, but with just your eyes, if you <coughs> catch the light from the sun, you split it up, uh, you'll get... Um, you'll be able to see what's known as the sun spectra, and you can identify exactly what the sun is made out of by looking at that. Uh, so, for example, the gas helium was discovered in the sun before it was found on Earth, which is why it's named after Helios, the Greek god of the sun. But when it comes to looking at planets and other stars, they're so far away and so small. I mean, the stars themselves are trillions and trillions of miles away, light years away, literally. So, uh, so, so things that could be much bigger than our own sun end up looking like teeny tiny dots. And we're trying to look at the planets around those stars. But what can happen is those planets can pass in front of those stars if it's, everything's lined up perfectly. They can what's called transit to the star. And that's how we discover these exoplanets usually um, kind of um, in the first place. So we look at these planets around distant stars. And if you see the star, appear to get a little bit dim, a little bit fainter, then that could be telling you that something's going around that star. And 
if you can isolate the light that is coming from that star, and it, if it skims the planet, it goes past th through the uh, uh, that planet's atmosphere, you can isolate that, split that up, and see what it's made out of. And the main thing here is the fact that we're looking at this great big planet that's going around a very distant star, and we have found water in the atmosphere. Now, this isn't telling us that there's life there or anything like that, because water is found all over space uh, there's water in lots of different places inside our solar system however it's kind of a, more of a demonstration of what can be done and this is something that's really really exciting uh, with the james webb space telescope and i'm really optimistic and i mean we we're talking a little bit about aliens earlier but i'm really hoping that the james webb space telescope will be able to find us uh, signs actual kind of evidence to suggest that there might be life somewhere else in the universe it's going to be by looking for signatures like this by looking for specific chemicals that could indicate there could be life on these distant worlds and there, there was also um a, another graph as well where they had discovered oxygen you know deep into the, the the galaxies that we saw right at the start as well i think those ones uh there was signs of oxygen around there so there are you know really in theory the building blocks of life so we were saying that there's probably chances there is even in that little speck there there probably is something going on um but um you know that they've already found in such a short time that oxygen water it's all possible there yeah yeah i mean it's very positive science right um oxygen in galaxies and the, the ones from the, the the big galaxy picture wasn't even in the cluster they were the from the distant ones so mm. obviously all these heavy elements ev pretty much everything heavier than uh, helium is made inside a star when it dies so you have to basically wait for the first stars in the universe to die first before we had the building blocks but the fact that they're already there we got oxygen we might get water you know we can have nitrogen that's in our atmosphere carbon which is really important for life well at least it is on earth and um, because life in the universe might not be like life on earth we don't know but we're going to start by looking like life on earth because that's a good place to start so we'll look yeah. for oxygen and water and stuff but the fact we see it in galaxies even at the very start of the universe's history is i mean it uh, to me it's all pointing in the right direction right surely and um, we're not going to you know we're, this telescope's not going to see you know, cities on other planets or spaceships. But it, if it showed us, for example, methane around an Earth-like planet, you know, methane is a gas that doesn't really form naturally close to star. Once a star has been born, all the gases that hang around near it get blown away because it's very hot near the star. Right? So you don't really tend to find ga like light gases like methane right next to a, a, a star. But we... And life produces quite a lot of methane. So we've got more methane in our atmosphere than usual because life makes it. So if we were to find that on an Earth-like planet, you'd think, oh, well, there you go. That is very good signs for life. It, it, I don't think it's enough to go, yeah, there's definitely alien cows down there. But it's a, it's a really good start, right? And if we're able to detect water even on this exoplanet, then maybe in the future, we're going to get more and more and more. And, and just to quickly go over that point that first image that we showed right that was only a 12 and a half hour exposure so that was 12 and a half hours hubble's best image ever which looks less good than that took well i, I think it was over a week it was, it was 11 11, so 11, 11 days. Days. <laughs> or for the ultra deep field that, that isn't actually the whole hubble ultra deep field but they're very similar images you know even in 12 hours you know that's just a quick one that the james webb can do you know first first image it sees nice and easy uh, when we start doing real science with it and do day-long exposures, I mean, yeah, who knows what we're going to find. Very, very exciting. Let's have a look at the last photo then because we are running out of time a little bit. Yeah. But um, Stefan's Quintet. Now, this is something that's been seen before, um, <laughs> certainly by Hubble. Here is the latest image. Um, tell us what we're, we're seeing here in this one then. It's a, a galactic merger of four galaxies and a fifth um, closest spiral galaxy adorning the frame as well so what, what what's going on here yeah so stephenson's quintet is a, a basically the biggest car crash that can happen in space it's when galaxies hit each other because they can if they form near each other their gravity over time will pull them towards each other and they crash into each other and they collide um and they're very 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 useful um to study how galaxies evolve uh, for example our milky way has collided with many galaxies in its past and it will collide in the future with Andromeda. 
And what we see is that when big galaxies hit other big galaxies, they, they kind of kill each other. <laughs> it's a really bad event. But it can also stimulate for uh, star growth, at least very briefly. Um, and that's one of the things that we can see in this image better than in other Hubble images. So because um, James Webb sees an infrared uh, light, it's really good at looking at hot gas. And where we see hot gas is usually where we see hot new stars, ones that have just been born. So you can see uh, sort of on the left, we've got a, a lovely sort of oval galaxy. Uh, that's not colliding with the rest. That one's in the way, um, as I said, or adorning the, flame, the frame, right? It's just there looking lovely. It's the other four in a line on the right that are colliding. And between the top one and the middle three, you see this big red streak of, of red gas, big red streak of red gas. And that's where the two envelopes, because these galaxies aren't just, you know, they're not just flat disks, right? They've got gas all around them that surrounds them. They have begun to merge. They've begun to hit each other. And as they hit each other, like we saw in the Carina Nebula, it helps gravity out. It promotes star formation. So you're looking at kind of regions in these galaxies where you're getting very intense star formation as they collide the last generation of stars in these galaxies because once they plow into each other they use up all that gas the rest is thrown off into space because they're very violent collisions um very very violent collisions they last a long time but they're still very violent for the galaxy and then that gas will be unusable the galaxy can't hold on to it anymore so it's really important to understand, well, how did our galaxy survive them? You know, it must be that uh, the galaxies that hit the Milky Way were much smaller. So we were able to survive this. And even some scientists now think perhaps our star was born as a result of a collision, that our star may have been born, in, we call them starbursts, because lots of stars being born at once, starburst, um, may have been born in a starburst when we were hit by another galaxy. So they're really, really, really fantastic to observe. They're not just, and they're obviously beautiful as well, wonderful images. But they help us understand our history and maybe the future of our galaxy as well, which I think is amazing. And amazingly, very quickly, in that top galaxy, you'd have to do a very big zoom right on the middle uh, because we do know that, that most big galaxies have a supermassive black hole in the middle. Um, you can even see the jets that come off the black hole, which is something that we're try we think is formed by very, very, very intense magnetic fields, but it's not something we're sure of. But we can now even see jets around the black hole, 200 million, I think this galaxy is a 200 odd million light years away from Earth. I, I find it phenomenal. It's a brilliant image. So those are the images released today from the James Webb Telescope. Just a few of your questions before we go um we've got one here that from dean who asks the question this is probably one for you finn what's going to happen to hubble now that james webb is there well hubble, hubble still has its uses right it's not it's not a dead and forgotten telescope uh, it's a visual telescope so we can still use it to do visual um visible light uh, astronomy right because the different wavelengths of light tell us very different things about the universe we don't use like infrared, for example, very good for looking at uh, sort of hot ionized gas regions, right? New stars being born. Um, whereas visible light is useful in other ways, right? X-ray light is very, very good at looking at black hole emissions because they're very, very, very hot, very, very intense lights, all right? So we can still use Hubble. It's still a brilliant telescope out there in space. It will still be used to study galaxies, um, to study nebula, to study even planets, uh, close home. So just because we've got a new, very good toy doesn't mean we're going to throw all the rest out. Um, obviously, me and Adam, we're not involved in uh, in doing our own research at Kielder. You know, we're, we're here to communicate science. Maybe Jürgen will even know more details about what Hubble might be used for in the future. Um, so, But it's definitely not defunct. It's not forgotten about. It. We'll still use it. Yeah, Jürgen, have you got anything to add on Hubble? I think I think Jürgen's um, camera might have frozen. He's, 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 he's been very still right now. Momentously still. <laughs> <Yeah>. It's all <laughs> right. Here he is again. Uh, Hello, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, 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 we're worried there for a second that you hadn't moved for yeah. so long. We're about to call the ambulance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's, you know, occasionally it happens. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we were just saying, what what's going to happen to Hubble now? Do you know? Yeah, Hubble is still... Uh, a very powerful instrument, they wouldn't just throw it away. And Hubble is built, they had the last maintenance of Hubble, and they made, they made it ready to last as long 
as possible at one point when Hubble does some advantages when you compare it with James Webb, like the different wavelengths range. Hubble can go up to the uh, near UV border or the blue light, can do astronomy in the blue light where uh, James Webb is not um, sensible, sensitive for. So it's definitely like when you build a bigger telescope, the smaller telescopes don't get uh, you, not used anymore. It's just do different science with them. Okay, one other question. Uh, Fiona says about the about the mentioning earlier about most of the stars have been born. How is that knowledge been arrived at? If you can do it in the simplest possible way. Uh, well, you can kind of look into galaxies in the past, right? So you can see galaxies when you look out in space. You look back in time, right? Telescopes are time machines. So the further you look, uh, the further back in the universe's history you can see. And we can look at the rate at which stars are being born at different times in the universe's history. So if we look back 10 billion years, we can look into a galaxy, we can see, um, for example, we use the colors of galaxies, we use the amount of metal there is in a galaxy, um, the brightness of a galaxy to see how many, ball, how many stars are being born in that galaxy every, every year, right, for example. And what we've seen is, it's a big curve. So a few, only a few billion years after the Big Bang, you get lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of stars being born, loads and loads of stars. And then it peaked, I've forgotten exactly uh, when this happened in the universe's history, but it peaked at some point, you had loads of stars being born, and then it began to dip again, right? Galaxies began to stop giving birth to many stars. We saw dips in the amount of stars being born. The brightness of these new bright hot stars was waning. We saw more old stars taking up the population. And now when you look at galaxies, we see lots and lots of old stars that have already been, usually the red ones, because red ones tend to live for longer. Red small stars live for a long time. Big blue stars are very fast. They're like, like rock stars. They live fast, die young, the blue stars. So uh, we have to wait for these to die. And you can see that the universe gets redder and redder and redder the closer we look in space. That means stars are being born less now than they were in the past. And by essentially, in maths terms, you, you integrate the area under the curve, right? You add them all up, uh, you add up all the stars you can see, and it'll give you a total number of stars that will ever be born. And we are pretty much all the way there, right? About 90 to 95% of the way there. Uh, and so as the universe progresses, I suppose it will get dimmer and redder as the stars begin to, to fade. That's not for a very, very long time. And um, it's a bit, bit sad to think about. Rather happier that we can look out with James Webb and see all these fantastic stars and galaxies still alive, still kicking, still forming new stars um, in brilliant detail. So that's, that's kind of how we do it. Another question from Les, who says, obviously we've seen these images of 13.8 billion light years away. Have we got any indication about how far the universe goes beyond that? I mean, that could just be the tip of the iceberg, couldn't it? Yeah, so that's a that's a really really difficult question because ultimately we have no idea. So we have what's <laughs> called the the observable universe, and that is just how far we can look. So the universe is only about thirteen point seven point thirteen point eight billion uh, years old, or that's how long ago we think the Big Bang was. And so Big Bang in a nutshell, everything was all in one place, and then it's been expanding since then. So there's only been a certain amount of time um, for light to travel from one place to another so um literally the furthest we can ever look is this distance of about 13.8 billion light years away roughly uh that literally has not been enough time for light to travel from further away to get to us so we have no idea what's outside the observable, observable universe it could be more of the same it could be it could, completely empty it could be full of giant space dinosaurs who knows? <laughs> or we'll never be able to know. And what if we're not the only universe? What if it's a multiverse? And it, there's just more. Oh, you know, that's a conversation for another day. But look, thanks very much, everyone, for, for joining us. Adam and Finn from Kielder Observatory. If you're going to be heading up to Kielder anytime soon, you may well see Adam and Finn delivering their, their knowledge to you in person. And, of course, have a look on the Kielder Observatory website to, to book in for any of the sessions that are coming up over the rest of the summer and into the autumn as well. And to Jürgen, thank you for, for joining us too with your expertise. Um, 
um, obviously being involved directly in the uh, in the in the mission in in creating some of the the equipment on there. Um, great insight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's been great to be able to talk about all of this because it's all been so exciting. Fun, yeah. yeah, and uh, wait, go up to Keeldrop Observatory and talk with them more about it. They will <laughs> will spill that information as much Absolutely. as possible. Definitely. Thanks to 100%. you for <laughs> thanks to you for watching. If you haven't checked out our previous episodes of the Keeldrop Observatory podcast, not all of them are a uh, video podcast like this. We do audio ones as well, but you'll find every episode on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and any other podcast app. Search for Keeldrop Observatory. Different topics covered there. We've covered uh, space volcanoes. We've covered stars. We've covered alien life. We've covered black holes everything i think and we will keep them coming every single month uh, and i think next month we will have a, a very special guest in the form of um one of the presenters of uh, sky at night is going to be joining us and uh, that will be chris lintot who will be with us um in august uh, so look out for that one uh, thanks to uh, everyone for watching and uh, hopefully see you soon up at keeldra observatory and if not there then uh, catch you soon on our next episode take care and have a great evening <laughs>